We have returned in the studio, John Bradshaw sitting with me. Uh, such a pleasure that we finally get together and talk on radio. I, I like it very and, much. And TV, YouTube, there's a YouTube crew out there. Uh, hopefully you're watching uh, on the TV or the video or internet, but also an audio at the same time. The book uh, is Reclaiming Virtue, and we're, we're, we're really kind of scratching the surface here. There's a lot of meat in this book. We'll cover what we can. Uh, I noticed in the uh, introduction of Reclaiming Virtue, the first heading or section is The Better Angels of Our Nature. Yeah. Explain that. Well, that was one of Abraham Lincoln's favorite sayings, you know, when he was appealing to Congress to stop slavery, that we, we you know, we have to appeal to the better angels of our nature. Mm -hmm. And then I quoted uh, a quote from Eric Erickson where he talked about uh, that the, the simplest truths of holy people, uh, it's right, I think it's right there. Uh, men have always shown a dim knowledge of their better potentialities by paying homage to those purest leaders who taught the simplest and most inclusive rules for an undivided mankind. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, why is it that we we get chills when we, we you know, we see what Gandhi did or we see what Martin Luther King did? Are you, are you those firemen at 9-11 or all those people mm -hmm. that, uh, the, that, that virtue comes out in people? They don't have to sit there and logicize about it. Mm -hmm. And there's a goodness in people that I don't think we talk about enough. You know, I'd love to see the, the nightly news have somebody on there, what Graham Greene calls saints without name. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I think it's a uh, control factor. I, I know ratings are involved, but, but you know, everything seems to be so fear-based in mainstream uh, media. And, uh, you know, you might want to talk about fear versus love because you wrote a book on love, too. But I think fear is uh, one of the worst things that just shuts us down, contracts us. So how can you be alive and have life force when you're constantly bombarded with fear? Absolutely. Yeah. And fear and shame, uh, that, that whole sense that I'm flawed and defective mm -hmm. as a human being. So I fear ever showing myself in any way. Now, that's part two of the book where I'm talking about recovering your innocence, mm -hmm. that we, we've we got to get back to do we have a lot of blocks in there that keep us from being authentically present? Yeah. And, and I need to be authentically present. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I are trying to adopt a three-year-old right now. Uh, at 77 this, or 76, this is quite a task. But You're I'm going to start you think we're <laughs> aging one or the other well, rapidly. I'm doing <laughs> so much better with her than I did my own kids because yeah. now I know all the developmental stages. I have more life experience and I, I can be more patient with her and kind and, uh, you know, I don't, anyway. That, You'll have to keep us posted on I, that. I will. Like I that. will. It's quite a. Yeah. It's quite a deal. Now, now, getting back to the better angels of our nature, there were some questions posed. Um, is this dim knowledge of our better potentialities a unique kind of moral intelligence that is part of human nature? One. If it is part of our nature, why is it that so few people develop it, develop it fully? And then, and if the rules taught by our purest leaders are so simple, why have I found it so hard to live virtuously? Uh, you know, very, and I know there's 500 pages to follow <laughs> exactly. that to try to answer those questions. Do you want to speak briefly in summary about that? Well, what I think is that it's much harder to develop a life of virtue than it is to memorize a bunch of dogma. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's easy. You, and, you know, and they had me doing that by, you know, the nun with the ruler. By the time I'm 12 years old, I can spout that Baltimore catechism. And Sister Ida has passed around actual pictures of hell one day, uh, you know, which my buddy and I wondered where she got them and finally decided she had been there uh, and come back to uh, haunt us. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, that kind of scare tactic. And here, here are the rules, and if you disobey them, See, it's good. What's good is good to you know. What's good to do is good. Don't be bribed by heaven or threatened by hell. Yeah. Now, in order to develop 
our appetite, our will, our emotions. This is what Aristotle meant by a right, a right appetite. Uh, and, and again, in terms of moral development, you know, I used to run the Sunday schools at Palmer Episcopal Church, and those parents would drop, drop the kids off and go play tennis, come back and get the kids, and, you know, oh, religious education is really important to you. Well, it, it's not. It's not important to them, and the kids are going to figure that out real fast. Yeah. And, and you know, in, in the same line of uh, reasoning about legislation and legal, you know, uh, my understanding is that you can't—, you can't uh, regulate or legislate um, virtue uh, it, you know you if you pass all these laws it's not it won't necessarily work now maybe some people out of fear uh, don't want to um, you know be um, found guilty of a murder or a robbery or something like that but there's the rece uh, what is the word uh, recetivism or you know th these people keep going back so they, see that's we, we, exactly what I was struggling with that I had been taught all this you had to memorize all of this but I wasn't virtuous mm -hmm. I could do the act of being the good holy person or I could be the the worst of the worst uh, but I didn't know how to find what Aristotle called the golden mean, the right choice. You know, he says being anger is easy. Anybody can do that. Be angry in the right way at the right time to the right person in the right context. That's what's difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and so that has to be learned. That's what's called, we're calling today moral intelligence. Yeah moral literacy and that's what's missing in moral education and you know you, you of course in the book you go into your own experiences uh, and and the term uh, hitting bottom and rising up and i think we've all hit our bottoms the question is how do we rise up you want to share any insights around that i mean you, you've done it uh, but it's taken a little bit of work and 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 you're a teacher you know it's it's hard for me to say exactly you know i've got a place in there called your angel and mine I, I, I give a story of what Martin Buber calls a grand will versus a puny will experience. And what, what he means by the grand will is what Joseph Campbell meant, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that you get a sense of your, your life and your destiny and the plan for your life. I was running on the highway in Minnesota. I'd run 11 miles further than I'd ever run. I see a face out on the horizon. It looks like my Jewish marketing manager, but I think it's the face of Christ. And I hear a word at the time I'm in a sexual addiction. And, 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 I, and I hear, a, I don't hear, I don't know what happened, but what I got was do the work you're intended to do and you won't worry about money anymore because I'd worried about money all my life. Well, from that moment on, now, uh, what stopped me with alcohol is just pain. You know, you just, uh, one day the pain of drinking and uh, using is so much worse than the pain of staying sober. Yeah. You say, and you know, that's it why. Ke it keeps getting worse and worse. There's no, there is no bottom really. I mean, no it's bottom. a pit. It's a pit. Yeah. And so one day you finally say, uh, this sure doesn't work. Yeah. But this was more, uh, in, in the sexual addiction, I can really identify with Tiger Woods because I had been celibate for 10 years. I felt a certain entitlement. I was very popular lecturer. And, uh, but anyway, once I came home, I remember coming back to the cabin and thinking, thank God I didn't say anything about sex, you know, <laughs> which was nuts. But I, I came back to Houston, uh, my home in Houston. I joined a group of guys from AA, and I uh, literally called Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And in that kind of a thing, well, with alcohol, you can't drink alcohol. You have to be completely celibate. With, and with this, it's how do you find a place to have a, a sexuality in your life. See, a moderation, mm -hmm. not an all or nothing. Yeah. So it was that experience that really helped me. And then I went into deep feeling work. Yeah. I, I want to take a break. I want to come back because, you know, maybe maybe we need to get back into addictions a little bit and, and what they are, addictions, attachments. I think that's what you're talking about. John Bradshaw with us in the studio here, so stay with us. This is a multiple-part series both for audio, radio, and YouTube. However you're seeing us or hearing us, we'll be back.